Hello everyone, I'm Bantanama, Leukemia Fellow at MD Anderson Cancer Center. And today we're at ASH, uh, the annual meeting at Orlando. And I'm joined by Dr. Mahesh Swaminathan here. Uh, and it's a pleasure to have you, Dr. Swaminathan. And uh, he's an assistant professor at MD Anderson Cancer Center as well. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Antana. It's a pleasure. Uh, so let me go ahead and um, ask you the first question. So uh, it's a very practical question, and it's also useful in the community setting. Uh, uh, how do you approach uh, dose reductions in, uh, with ibrutinib in clinical practice? And how does emerging data um, uh, tell us about managing, uh, maintaining patients on treatment and also managing the side effects? Excellent question. I think this is very relevant to the current clinical practice. We see so many patients still on ibrutinib, and we did see that uh, you know, ibrutinib is still being considered as one of the, uh, you know, uh, 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 the covalent BTK of choice in uh, many European countries. So I will just, you know, take a little step back because, you know, we did have this data at MD Anderson where we did check the BTK occupancy, especially in patients who started off like at the full dose of ibrutinib and then had to like dose reduce. This was for trial. And what we saw was that the BTK occupancy was kind of maintained. So that was very much reassuring that we are not really like, uh, you know, missing out on the efficacy when these patients have to, you know, go down on the dose. So uh, in, in my current clinical practice, you know, if I have patients who are currently on ibrutinib and they have to have a dose reduction for whatever the reason be, I still tend to do that because safety kind of like, you know, really, uh, you know, takes the precedence in these situations. So I, I'm not really concerned more about like, you know, loss of efficacy. So uh, I, I still do it. Um, in, in terms of like, you know, starting someone on like a lower dose of ibrutinib, that is something I have not done because the data is such that it's very rare that in the United States that we start with the, uh, you know, ibrutinib as the first choice, unless there is something that financially the patient is a little limited. Uh, that we know that there is an ongoing Taylor study and they are exploring the lower doses, maybe once that trial is read out. So it will give us more understanding and like, you know, uh, a, a kind of uh, a, a guidance in terms of how to go about this. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I, and I think that's very important, especially um, uh, considering like, uh, because it's a very difficult discussion and um, uh, trying to balance the side effects and also maintain that efficacy. So I think that's important. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and uh, the next question that I have is like about the frontline options uh, with the recent data from uh, the Taylor trial and also the CLL-17 trial. How does that shape your discussion when it comes to talking to your patients about choosing between continuous BTK inhibitor therapy versus uh, time-limited treatment? So, yeah, I mean, you know, we all are excited with the CL17 data that was presented today. Um, you know, one point that has been really, like, you know, reformed uh, from the data is that, you know, the time-limited treatment is as good as the continuous treatment. So I'm sure you, you know this as well. We do get some patients who just come and ask us, okay, doc, you tell me like, you know, you're going to be putting me on a time-limited treatment and the CLL is less likely to be cured with the time-limited. So why am I not on any treatment just on a continuous uh, basis? So this data is going to help me kind of like, you know, help these patients be uh, educated that, you know, that should not be the concern. And, and uh, you know, if and when possible, the patient is otherwise interested and is a candidate for, uh, you know, fixed duration, and that should be the one that should be paid. Very rarely we do get to patients at MD Anderson where a patient does not want to be on any time limited, just want to be on a pill and not worry about the disease progression. So there are few patients who can still benefit from that approach. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good approach. Uh especially with more and more patients asking about this, learning about like time limited options and asking questions like, hey, why am I, why should I not be on this time limited treatment? So I think that's an important thing. And the other question that I have for you is, um, we saw recent data from an ASH poster about a uh, signal for secondary uh, lymphoid malignant fees and also long-term risk in CLL. So how does that influence like your risk benefit discussion that you're having with patients when considering continuous BTK inhibitor therapy versus time-limited treatment? I know this question is very close to your heart. I know you had a poster as well on yeah. this area. 
So, I mean, this is a very tricky question that gets asked, uh, you know, every year because we see these secondary cancers, not just, uh, you know, non-melanoma cutaneous cancers. We do see solid tumor. Um, now, the real question is, is that the treatment or the disease just doing it? Because uh, that that particular question needs to be answered in order to have a better, you know, understanding of like, you know, how the patients should be guided. That being said, you know, even if we think that, you know, there is a chance that the treatment is doing something because that's what you're supposed to show, that patient did uh, have like a higher, uh, you know, hazard of, uh, you know, getting any kind of secondary malignancies when they are, when treated with like, you know, COVID and BTK inhibitor. So this is another like, you know, uh, a point to favor time-limited treatment because, uh, you know, the cancers are not going to develop in like, you know, a, a month or two. It's probably going to take some time. So that is how I would just like, you know, put it forward to the patient. And if they're particularly concerned about that, which actually I have had few patients really bring that up to me. And, and I tell them that, you know, it's probably there happening and might happen because of the disease, even if they were not to be treated. So, and, and for their like, you know, uh, 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 peace of mind, it's not a bad idea to just get them on a time limited treatment and not have to worry about this problem, you know, years and years later. Yeah, that's uh, thanks for your uh, sharing your insights, and it was a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thanks for having us.